Welcome to the Your Fork, Our Planet event with Dr. Openlander. T- today we are going to he- watch a 14-minute um, address to the parliament that Dr. Openlander did, and that will be followed by a little mini brainstorming session, and then we'll go live with Dr. Openlander via Skype and have a question and answer. So I wanted to read from Dr. S- um, Openlander's bio so that you have an idea of who we're going to be able to hear from. So Dr. Richard Openlander, author of the groundbreaking book, Food Choice and Sustainability, is a consultant, researcher, and researcher whose award-winning book, Comfortably Unaware, has been endorsed as a must-read by Ellen DeGeneres, Dr. Jane Goodall, and Dr. Neil Barnard, among many others. Dr. Openlander is a much sought after lecturer and has been a keynote speaker for several conferences and events and has presented lectures and workshops at numerous universities and corporations. Dr. Openlander also serves as an advisor to municipalities in the U.S. and to world hunger projects that are designing programs from his model of multidimensional sustainability. Since the early 1970s, Dr. Openlander has studied the effect of food choices on our health and immune and immense impact those choices have on the environment. He is president and founder of the organic vegan food production and education business, as well as the founder of the nonprofit organization, Inspire Awareness Now. With his work, Dr. Openlander addresses the fact that our current choice of foods is the leading contributing factor for global depletion, detrimental climate change, the loss of our land and fresh water, devastation of our oceans, rapid loss of biodiversity and mass extinctions, world hunger and food insecurity, and loss of our own health. Importantly, Dr. Openlander frankly discusses the imminent and narrowing timelines we face in terms of resolution and that time may indeed be running out for our own survival as a species. In compelling fashion, he reveals serious inefficiencies and unsustainable practices in our current food production systems and explores unique solutions. Along the way, Dr. Openlander challenges audiences with new insights regarding how this has occurred and what factors impede us from realizing positive change, exposing our constraining cultural, social, educational, governmental, and even media influences. Dr. Openlander presents an unapologetic and comprehensive view with the new perspectives and the disclosure of information upon which many authors are unwilling to tread. Dr. Openlander's main objective within both his writing and speaking is to raise the level of awareness and accuracy of information as it pertains to the critical topic of a plant-based diet being the best and most sustainable option for our bodies, the animals, and the earth. Food choice is rarely positioned within the sustainability conversation and is often negligibly or wrongfully discussed in information regarding our health. Dr. Openlander writes, consults, and lectures for the purpose of repositioning food choice as the most significant component within the campaign for a more sustainable and healthy planet and for those who inhabit it contending that without complete and swift replacement of all animals and animal products with plant-based alternatives, we will likely not reach a point of sustainability. Conversely, the newfound global awareness and immediate adoption of a fully plant-based diet and agricultural systems, the highest level of relative sustainability will be achieved and we will flourish as a civilization. So let's go now to his parliamentary address. Okay, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Richard Openlander and uh, he will uh, have a presentation. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Grazie mille. Distinguished members of parliament and guests, ladies and gentlemen, knowing and doing. There's a very real and imminent threat to our existence that is not found in the headlines of the news because no one wants to talk about it. There's a bit of an awareness gap and no one's willing to step forward and manage it. 
The film Cowspiracy divulges the massive environmental damage attributed to animal agriculture, providing us with just a glimpse of the many shocking facts, figures, and ratios. Some of these numbers have changed slightly since the film was made, and I'd be happy to review those with you at some point in time later. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient, wasting resources, energy, and lives. But what you see in Cowspiracy, the film, is just the very tip of the iceberg. What the film does not spell out are the critical timelines that confront us, as well as the most destructive, insidious constraints that prevent us from proper evolution, including pervasive misuse of the word sustainable itself. We humans have reached a crucial and fragile point in our evolutionary journey as a species. Just in the past hundred years, we've reached the Anthropocene era, where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere the litho, hydro, and atmosphere. We're ruining the very environs that sustain us and all other life on Earth. We're in fact in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet than what it can provide. It would take one and a half to two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. In the United States and right here in Belgium and with many other European countries, it would require four or more of our planets to sustain our current lifestyle. In fact, five out of nine planetary boundaries or tipping points of our life support systems on Earth have already been passed, five out of nine. And with the other four boundaries, we're exceeding their tolerance levels. And all nine boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. Although climate change is taking front stage everywhere, especially in Paris this week, we must recognize that it is just one of the nine boundaries. There are a few researchers and organizations who are quite aware of the dire predicament that we're in and the very short timelines that we're faced with. Any of these folks will bluntly tell you that our species is in a state of unsustainability and that we can't remain on this course for very much longer. But not one of them is connecting the final dot. They continue telling us that our survival is in peril and that we need to change. But change what? And they make it very clear that we need to stop overconsuming and overproducing. But overconsuming and overproducing what exactly? Energy and fossil fuels and waste are very easy targets for them to point their fingers at. But we now know that the single sector most responsible for nearly all aspects of our unsustainability combined, or what I call global depletion, is that of animal agriculture, the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. Let's take a close look at just a few of the many, many timelines that we're faced with. A 40% shortage in freshwater supplies predicted to occur in just the next 14 years. All topsoil predicted to be lost in the next 60 years. Phosphorus and nitrogen balance irreversibly altered today. Mass extinctions occurring daily. 87% of oceanic fish species are overexploited around the verge of collapse today. Nearly all commercially recognized fish expected to be extinct by the year 2048. And on and on. So we clearly need to quickly change our ecological footprint. We can blame overpopulation but are we really gonna begin culling other humans? We can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but that'll take too long, and climate change is, again, just one of the planetary boundaries confronting us. We must remember that climate change is also an exacerbator. It takes matters and makes them worse. At the beginning of the sustainability equation is the word itself, sustainable, which is now seen everywhere, but this word is typically misused and it's ill-defined because rarely, if ever, is food choice properly positioned, especially the raising and eating of animals. Despite its enormous effect, it's simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially. This is the reason, though, that we're in a sustainability crisis today. As a global community, we have been too slow in realizing the state of unsustainability that we're in. We've been vastly too slow in making the connection to animal agriculture, and we've been indifferent to act. The future holds some troubling trends. The global human population is predicted to reach 9.6 billion by the year 2050, two billion more than we have today, with rising numbers and wealth of the middle class, and the demand for meat and dairy products is expected to double from where it is today. Over three billion tons of grain were produced last year in the world, but nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. We can't blame, therefore, climate change, droughts, or flooding for the world's food security issues. Clearly the problem is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the 900 million suffering from hunger or the growing human population, but rather where 
all the food globally being produced is going. The onus for this predicament lies with our leaders who have failed us in this regard, our business leaders, academic and funding institutions, civil society organizations, and our policymakers. Sustainable development has been on the international agenda for more than 25 years, with vigorous talk about the economic, social, and ecological components, but in reality, only the economic aspect has been addressed at the detriment of our environment. Even with the new 17 sustainable development goals recently agreed upon, the effect of animal agriculture is not properly positioned, and we must understand that it is our environment that will ultimately sustain our species and society and be the parameter by which wealth is measured. These are just some of the many resource comparisons. You'll be able to pick up much more of these during the film. The formula for success in developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and for developed countries to follow, is to establish models of multi-dimensional sustainability that I've written about, established on many levels simultaneously with plant-based food systems at the nucleus. Education and international funding should use this as the platform for responsible lending to then achieve the highest level of responsible, sustainable development. Today, we're floating around precariously in a zone or state that I call pseudo-sustainability, never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we are sustainable. That's a very dangerous situation. And for anyone who believes that eating any animal product is sustainable, then it's time to understand the concept of optimal or optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to produce and consume any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? Just during the past one hour, over 8 million domesticated land animals were slaughtered. Over 200 million sea animals were caught and killed for us to eat. And 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock we're still raising. But during that same one hour, over 350 children in the world died from starvation. These numbers should be zero. This then becomes a matter of ethics, doesn't it? It becomes a matter of social justice. The person sitting next to you who's eating a steak, pork, chicken, cheese, or fish is taking away the resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently, and used to support the life of perhaps 20 other people and thousands of other species while helping to mitigate climate change rather than causing it. The Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all animal species in the world just in the last 40 years due to loss of habitat and degradation. Not surprisingly, during that same 40-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. Instead of ignoring the effect of animal agriculture on climate change, the participants at COP21 in Paris should understand that there are working examples today showing complete mitigation of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions from all sources by way of sequestration simply by converting feed cropland and grazing livestock pastures to direct plant-based systems. So animal agriculture weaves its way recklessly through irreversible climate change, loss of land and fresh water, oceanic destruction, loss of biodiversity and rapid rate of extinctions, world hunger, pollution, food pricing and availability, increase in chronic and emerging diseases regarding our own human health, as well as policymaking and funding. Thus, animal agriculture blocks our evolution to a higher ground toward a healthier, more peaceful, and just planet. In terms of solutions, this is not a time for us to take baby steps or for us to go meatless only on Mondays because we are on very real timelines that extend beyond self into society and future societies, human and non-human life. We're all connected. Eating only local food will not solve the problem because it's not the size of the farm or the miles traveled that causes the problem. It's the type of food being produced. And despite what the United Nations and other gold standard organizations are promoting, this sustainability issue will not be solved simply by advocating eating less meat, which is subjective, inconsistent with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem, and perpetuates irresponsibility with every bite taken. And it mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood. Regarding our oceans, the damage we've done is irreversible in our lifetime. And today, there is no such thing as sustainable seafood, especially if you apply the three key factors of how that word sustainable is defined by the fishing industry itself. 
And contrary to what everyone would like to believe, raising grass-fed, organic, pastured livestock will not solve the problem either. It'll make matters worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, more methane produced, and a higher feed conversion ratio. It also must be clearly understood that this is not an industrial or a factory farm issue. It's a raising animals to eat issue. Farm to table and climate smart agriculture are new catchwords and terms, but these new food movements only make sense if you use our dwindling natural resources to grow plants for direct human consumption. We no longer have room for animals to be configured in the middle of the food production equation for humans. It's become antiquated. It's become obsolete. So how do we solve this? Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of solutions. First, there needs to be widespread sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. We need to essentially educate the educated. And second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies which open the doors for businesses and help new and also young farmers and help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems, beginning with the reallocation of the $500 billion per year we spend globally subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. In her closing remarks at a recent climate change conference of the parties, the executive secretary of the conference, Christiana Figueres, provided a summary of the conclusions of 200 nations, NGOs, and researchers by stating this about our future, about greenhouse gas emissions, and about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And she said, we must do this immediately. Notice that she didn't say we should use less coal or for us to use only local or humane coal. In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it roughly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions, slightly more, depending on who you're reading, than raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on land use changes, water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, and all other areas of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So the door has been opened hasn't it, for massive global food choice change. If there is an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and for it to be done immediately. Our generations of policymakers today are in a unique situation to help save Earth as we know it, save life on it now, and allow a livable future for those who inherit this planet from us. Or we could allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. But we have enough information in front of us to make the right decisions. And in doing so, we will be seen not just as good stewards, but as superheroes who stopped a runaway train with all of us on board and turned it into the direction of optimal sustainability before we went over that cliff. The future of humanity is very likely at stake. So you in this room represent our leaders, and you can make this happen. You can inspire others to make this happen, but we have to act today because time is running out. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. It's certainly a privilege for me to be here. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna call Dr. Openlander right now. So questions, I would like me not to be the only person who asks the questions. So those of you who have questions, can you? Hello. Hello. Greetings to you. All right. So we have several questions. I'm going to ask a couple, and then I'm going to have a couple students ask questions as well, and then we'll go back to me probably because I have a bunch. So I have a, <laughs> right. a, a student that asked this question. Are, cur yes. the, are the current effects caused by animal agriculture with regard to climate change irreversible? Has the greenhouse gas emissions from ca the cows already played out something that the earth is unable to naturally come back from or human intervention fix. I understand the actions we take now can stop further damage altogether, but how about the damage already done? That was one of my students named Frank. Okay. Frank. Well, is Frank there? No. He's okay. in another class. Well, well, that's okay because I think Frank has presented a package of, of 
of questions within that one question. So, and I know you know what I mean, because really what we're talking about is, um, first of all, let's separate that, that out a little bit, okay? And can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you great. Okay, so let's separate that out a little bit. First of all, green, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, you know, um, the, gra the gas emissions that we produce, humans produce, um, have, they're, they're basically five different types. We don't have to get real technical about it, but of, of, of the greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing, some will stay in the atmosphere much longer than others. And most of them can be, most of them can be sequestered. They can be, we can, we can mitigate the damage. We, and so the best way to look at this is, is that if we continue on our current path of uh, how, how many animals we're using for livestock, how much land we're using, uh, the, the, pretty much the whole scenario of animal agriculture. If we continue on the current path, then the damage that we are doing now will be irreversible in our lifetime in terms of their effects on climate change. In fact, we can predict that even without any fossil fuel use at all from this day forward, just, just the, by, by the greenhouse gases emitted from livestock alone, we will continue to see rising seas in our oceans. We'll continue to see uh, irreversible damage to, in terms of acidification and warming of our oceans, uh, which has already reached that point now. But even without fossil fuel or without um, greenhouse gases emitted from our, um, our use of, uh, of energy, um, we, we will still see that just because of the effects of animal agriculture. We can extrapolate that out. So, so to separate that question out a little bit further, um, that if we continue on the path we currently are on now, we will not be able to reverse things out, no, even without fossil fuel use. Okay, now that being said, there are models today, I want to make sure this is real clear, there are models today that display or that, that demonstrate that if we, that we, if we took all, if we converted all cropland that's being used right now in the world to grow crops to feed livestock, we converted the, that cropland and we converted all pa grazing pasture land that are where livestock is now being used to graze, we converted th those agricultural lands to specific regenerative plant-based systems like agroforestry, organic systems that are just growing uh, f basically plants for us to eat directly, we could mitigate all the greenhouse gases that are being produced by all sources uh, today. So 54 gigatons are being produced per year right now by all sources. So if we changed out our, our agricultural systems to be purely plant-based, we would end up having a, a series of systems that would be able to take what's currently in our atmosphere and sequestered into the soil. So on one hand, if we, if we don't change uh, immediately and drastically our food choice habits, meaning the higher up on the food chain, the worse it is in terms of greenhouse gases and climate change. If we don't eliminate them entirely, we will be on, we, will, we are doing damage that's irreversible in our lifetime. In the other direction, if we can change them out as soon as possible within the next, say, year to two years, we could, we have models that show that we can, it, 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 not that we shouldn't reduce our footprint from fossil fuels either, but I'm saying that that's how serious and how large the damage is that we're doing just from animal agriculture, is that we could mitigate entirely all 54 gigatons of greenhouse, carbon equivalent greenhouse gases per year just by changing our, our, our food choices entirely over. Okay, I have another kind of a question that's related to that one from another student. And she, um, <laughs> she starts with knowing that everyone will not become vegans, which I mm -hmm. don't want to assume that, but how many mm -hmm. people need to become vegan in order to make a significant difference? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to... Well, you know what? That, that's a great question. It really is. And it seems like some form of that question hits you or me mm -hmm. about wherever, wherever we are, mm -hmm. but especially with the environmental concerns. So 
the, the reason that, that that question arises for so many people is because, number one, they don't really, you know, this trans theoretical model of behavior change, you know, that, that you know, a person won't change unless they, A, become aware of what, mm -hmm. what you know, what factors are at play that where a change is even needed, and B, is they have to own it. It has to mean something to them. Well, the person who's who asking that question is really not unlike the 98% of other individuals in the world that don't, A, don't have the full awareness of how serious the damage is, and B, they don't own it. Now, that's not a negative comment. That's just saying once this person and up the other 98% of individuals in the world really understand that all of us are creating irreversible damage with every single thing we eat, uh, if it's animal aggregate. If it's from an animal agricultural base, um, it's creating damage that we that we are, are going to have very serious difficulties overcoming. Okay, so then then the first part of that, that question would be, why wouldn't you change? You know, so I I have the opinion that whether it's from a grassroots effort or a bottom down, you know, top down approach, bottoms up, top down, uh, meaning. As we start running out of more and more resources, there will be policies enacted for this person. Uh, that will, that will, will that person will say, you know, it looks like we have a law now saying that I can't eat meat one day a week, two day a week, three day a week, and then find every day. Because, because policymakers will understand that it's not in our best interest to continue depleting, depleting uh, natural resources at a rate that we can't support. So. So the first part of that question is, I tend to think that everybody will will become plant-based. And it's not the word that is the problem here. You know that. It's not everybody has to be vegan. Everybody has to lower their ecological footprint. If you want to call it, uh, you know, eating green things or whatever, fine. But you're called vegan. You know, point is, we all have to be aware of our ecological footprint and the fact that we're, we're uh, displacing species, we're ruining our environment at a rate that we can't sustain. So I think everybody will, at some point, whether it's from an increased awareness or a top-down approach or a combination of both, mm -hmm. we will, at some point, have to be eating only plant-based foods. So now, the second part of that question is then, okay, it's, it's a little bit empirical, isn't it? I mean, you, <laughs> you know, to, to say that, okay, how, how, little, how little change do we have to do to create the difference that's seen? Well... I don't think that can be answered very well at all because um, it's very subjective. And right now, the, po the human population is expected to be 9.6 billion by the year 2050. And it's very difficult to point at what each person can eat in terms of something that is, is uh, it's still creating too high of an ecological footprint for the Earth to sustain. So the way that I look at it is how can we best, for instance, for instance, uh, most people don't understand our oceans, and this is, I'm sure you'll probably have some, hopefully, some questions about our oceans. But if, you know, most countries that I, that I speak at right now, policymakers and most general public and most think tanks that I speak at, don't really correlate what we need to do with our oceans. They still think that sustainable fishing, eating sustainable seafood will somehow get us on track. What our oceans need it will, will help answer this person's question is it needs complete rest in order for it to turn around, and it still won't turn around in our lifetime. But if we want to, to help our oceans, the best way possible is to give it rest, which means you don't take anything out of it, and you don't contribute, continue to contribute in, uh, acidification and warming. So the best answer is to say, we need to do what we can, and the very best possible thing we can do is change completely today. So I'd rather, you, you, I don't think anybody could sit here and say, you know, if you're doing something that's detrimental to species or to our environment, how how much of that detrimental thing you do to get away with it? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that that's a good thing. I don't even want to tackle that. All right. Go ahead. I'm going to have one of our students ask a question, and then I'll come back. And I do have some questions that students have come up with about the ocean, so we'll be back. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Hi, Dr. Over Overlander. Um, Hello. So in your parliamentary address um, that we just watched here, um, 
in our theater. You mentioned that although, although the world leaders have had sustainability on their agenda for the past 25 years, the, only the economic aspect of that has been focused on? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So do you see our global economic system uh, of capitalism as an impediment to the health of our planet? Uh, and also, how do we ensure equitable distribution of control over our food sources? Yeah, well, you know, that's a great question, and that's a keen, a keen eye you have in terms of what, you know, picking up what I said. Sustainable development, I mean, we can talk a little bit about millennial development goals. They were put into place by the United Nations, and uh, they were, they were since, since then, just last year, they were replaced by the 17 sustainable development goals by the United Nations. And those goals, yeah, they, they, they've been, they, that type of topic has been on the international agenda, right, for about 25 years now. The difficulty is, is that they haven't been able to make the connection they're, they're really, whether it's through the scientific community, community or our policymakers, they haven't been able to make the connection correctly uh, between poverty, hunger, and, and food choices. So I, I think the issue first isn't so much displacing or thinking that we have to change ca our, our capitalistic views, because I think there's money to be made by saving the world. I do. I think there's, you know, that we have to we have to connect it though better. We I think that we have to create policies that allow businesses to make money to be able to sell products at a lower rate, you know, in numbers to the general public, and in, in dealing with our in dealing with the environmental issues that we have. So I think that once that's done, I think that the only way to solve it is by having uh, a, a, a capitalistic. Uh, approach because I think I think there's a way that we can even if you're talking about impoverished you're talking about the, the impoverished people in certain developing countries you know there are ways to create channels and value chains for them based on how they're sustaining their environment by just creating uh, uh, our funding has to be changed around most of the funding right now is 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 being is being channeled through the meat and dairy and fishing industries so once the once the policies are made where we, for instance, take our $500 billion a year that are being spent globally on subsidies for these industries, change that to help transition farms to help, to, to help them and to help reduce the cost of these goods. And so, no, I think capitalism is going to play out fine. I think, though, that um, the mode of how it's playing has to change. You know, we have to cr create this, this uh, synchronization of, of awareness with our policymakers to how to really solve hunger problems, hunger issues, combining it with uh, our, environment, our, environment, our environmental issues. And that's where the sustainability goals will be achieved. And so uh, the next, by the way, the next uh, four or five years up to the year 2020, and then finally to the year 2030, uh, there, are, there are goals in place now, but they'll never be reached either. Uh, it's not only the previous 25 years, it's the next you know, 14 years until they properly position food choice into their into their sustainability uh, uh, goals. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, you know, there, there's a way to achieve this, but we have to combine it into an, a larger awareness and more increased awareness, and then and then certainly combine capitalism with improving the health of our, our planet, as well as improving the health and of uh, the indigenous people that are suffering right now. Yeah, that definitely addresses my first question. Um, but the second one that deals with who has control over our food systems. Um, yes. I think right now what we're seeing is extreme degradation of areas where um, people don't have control over the land around them. And That's right. a lot of times you have out of state or out of um, country even um, entities who are using the land for like, you know, we, I think you talked about Brazil and how a lot of people have lost their lives trying to protect the land there. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, what can we do to ensure that whatever system takes the place of what we have now is one where the people who um, have the most at stake of yes. land use? Okay, well, what you're saying right now really is the essence of the future of our food. There's no question about it. So what we need to do is first look at the picture and then realize what we can do to help that picture. So the picture that's, be, that's going to be painted that's, that over the landscape of our food 
and how it's being produced to, to feed the, the extra 2 billion people in the world. Here's what's going to happen. It's, it's starting to happen today. Okay, We don't have a great deal of arable land in the United States or in Europe um, that's not being used uh, for, uh, that's, that's not being used by livestock. Okay, so we have to, and, and most of the land that's going to be used will come from tropical rainforests in uh, Brazil, but it's also going to come from sub-Saharan African countries, at, countries that, where there's already land grabbing going on, and there's all, already um, uh, per, s a very large purchasing of land tracts to to continue on the livestock industry, where uh, there's this triad where. Uh, China, the China the people in China want to eat more meat, and and uh, so they're uh, buying large lands of track, tracts of land where they can grow crops to feed the livestock and also grazing livestock. Okay, so this is what we have to do as a global community and as the United States and European countries. To do is that what we have to do is that we have to demand that we are eat, we have to create a demand where we're eating only plant-based foods, something that is, is uh, most sustainable possible for our world, okay? Once we do that and we get behind it, the, the land is still going to be used in Brazil and it's still going to be used in Africa, but it's going to be used more efficiently. And those people in Africa, can, we can create these, these value chains of the food that they're producing and they'll become more profitable. Their lands will become more fertile and and the, and we will not have those degraded lands that you're talking about, that's desertification. But it all comes from from all of us collectively moving this critical mass forward. And it, just imagine the whole world asking for plant-based foods. Well, you're going to have a tremendous a tremendous efficiency shift. We won't need to use the the, the uh, rainforest in Brazil that, that they're using for livestock, and and we won't you need to to continue to degrade land. See, so it's all one large, big landscape that we have to understand. And it comes, I think, it all is derived from, from our demand. You know, the, the minute we stop demanding those seriously inefficient food products, such as are found in animal agriculture, the, the sooner that we can do that, the sooner we're going to be able to create a situation where there will be less degradation in the world. Great. That helps a lot. Thank you. hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. All right, I'm back with a couple questions. So <laughs> let me ask questions um, from students about the oceans. So I'll ask yeah. a couple of them, and then you can decide how to answer them. But um, what does it mean? There was it was in Cowspiracy the statement when our oceans die, we die. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to understand that a little bit more, and how will fishless oceans affect humans other than having no fish to eat? Mm -hmm. So it's, they're kind of related, but. Different. Yeah, they are. Do you want me to do you want me to answer that real quickly? Sure. Yes. I can answer that those two together real quickly. Okay. First, first of all, we need to understand that our, our oceans are are sort of like the blood the blood of our system. Okay. So it's going to it 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 allows um, it allows our our weather patterns. It's a meteorological uh, nucleus for so so almost everything that. Our oxygenation, our oxygen itself in our atmosphere, the balancing out of heat, um, it's our climate control mechanism, okay? So, and what happens is, is that those, those um, things that we're eating on land that are causing warming and acidification in our oceans, part of that question is correct. If we, if we run out of fish in our oceans, um, we won't have any fish to eat, okay? But our oceans will not be able to create the climate regulatory mechanisms that they have been. And it'll be because of warming and acidification on land, but it'll also be because um, fish also act as if a, uh, a carbon dioxide and, and methane and greenhouse gas emissions sequestration device. And they, they balance out, not only do they, there have been a couple of really great studies about this, um, but not only do they sequester uh, greenhouse gases themselves, especially deep fish, but they balance out, um, they balance out algae, and plankton, and those are the things that are creating the carbon dioxide oxygen cycle. And, so, and they're also helping to keep the, the uh, balance of, of heat. So if that is imbalanced, all of a sudden we will have, uh, we will have uh, a, a greater acceleration of warming and of, of our planet. 
and that's without fish. Uh, and so, and so it, 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 they both go hand in hand. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, but basically, that's it. I mean, we can't keep, the point is we can't keep eating animals on land. It creates warming and acidification. But at the same time, every time we are extracting fish from our oceans, we are taking out the ability for our oceans to balance them, to help balance uh, global, uh, climate change and global warming as well. Okay. Okay. So one other question with regard to the oceans. Can you explain a little bit about the ocean's dead zones? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. Uh, right now, um, actually, I don't, I forgot exactly the number that was used in the film, but today it's 550 to 580 uh, dead zones around the world that now are about 100,000 square miles of, of areas completely devoid of life. So what it is is, is that um, in nearly all of those dead zones, it, they basically are created by surface runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers and animal agriculture operations on land that, that run off into our streams, that run off into our rivers, that then, that then move out into our oceans. So all of these dead zones are basically produ are, are produced by animal agriculture on land. In fact, there are a couple of these dead zones that uh, scientists are hoping to reverse out just by uh, minimizing the, the animal agriculture, the livestock industries that are, that are, um, that are contributing to these, uh, um, these, uh, these dead zones uh, right out of the spillways in the oceans. So, and they can reverse themselves out. Those can reverse themselves out. If we stopped all animal agriculture upstream, you would see those reversing out. It'd still take a few decades, but they would, they would reverse out, likely in our lifetime. Whereas, whereas removing fish and extracting certain fish species in our oceans will not, will not come back in our lifetime. There's some that are on the verge. There, some have already become extinct, and some, are, some species are on the verge of extinction right now. Okay. Um, one of the students was wondering, how does the U.S., as far as our animal agriculture, fit into the global piece? Because he wasn't able to see that in the film. We was focused, obviously, a lot of it on the U.S., but what piece of the whole global situation are we responsible for? Yeah. Well, we're responsible for uh, the largest piece. And the reason is uh, because we're considered leaders. We sort of set the stage for not, I'm not, I'm not just talking about our culturally, our cult culturally extended food preferences. I'm talking about how funding is, is achieved and uh, various, uh, uh, various approaches to how land is being used and how fresh water is being used. So if the United States, for instance, stopped, or, or not stopped, but transitioned all of our livestock operations into purely plant-based systems, and then use all of our funding mechanisms, whether it's philanthropy with you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or, or any other of the, of the billions of dollars they're spending each year funding, uh, financing uh, agricultural systems around the world, if, if, we just, uh, if we just moved all of our operations, whether it's, whether it's functionally with agricultural systems and farming or policymaking or funding, we just moved all that into plant-based systems, you would see a, a major paradigm shift in everyone else in the world uh, because you, you, would see it, uh, you would see it affecting everybody. China would be the last involved, but they would, be, they would, they would almost be coerced into changing because so much of our agricultural systems are affecting what they're doing right now. Um, so they would be last on the list, and unfortunately, they're one of the larger you know, drivers of agricultural systems right now. The United States is, is really the leading uh, nucleus right now for, for that. Okay. A couple of questions about some of the statistics in Cowspiracy. So the 666 gallons of water per quarter pounder. Can you explain that a little bit or? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start by saying a couple things. I think this will help round things out a little bit. Uh, I can explain any of the statistics. Some of the statistics have changed a little bit. They always change a little up and down. Um, but they're still, I think the overall aspect is exactly the same. The only thing that has changed a little bit more importantly are the numbers related to climate change uh, that our gold standards like United Nations are using. And I can go over that at any point in time. But, but about the freshwater usage, basically, 
it depends where in the world you are producing the cow to give you the beef that'll create the quarter pounder, presuming it's beef. But it's the same with, with, with any animal. It, for instance, in some areas in California, not too far from you, it requires likely 5,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. Okay, that's because, that's because of just the amount of water that is being produced in the feed. It's a little higher in certain parts of California and other parts in the world. But as a global average, it's about 1,800 gallons per pound, up to 25, 24 to 2,500 gallons per pound. So then you just divide that by four and you get your quarter pounder. Uh, but, you know, I think it needs to be said, it's not just the water. It's the emissions of greenhouse gases. It's the land use. You know, right now, 45% of all the land used in the world is for, is for livestock. So there are a lot of things that are being affected by that quarter pounder. It's not just, you know, it's not just the water. But you also have to calculate, and I mean, right now, the average water footprint of of the uh, typical Amer with a typical American diet is between 1,500 and 2,000 gallons of water per day. That's their virtual water footprint. So, and 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 really, about 1,000 to 1,200 gallons of that is from their choice to eat animal product. So, you know, you can you can you can see where that fits. I mean, you can reduce your water. Everybody listening there, and everybody in the United States could reduce their water footprint by well over a thousand gallons a day every day by just eliminating meat dairy from their from their from their diet rather than what most proponents will say just you know cut the water usage down on your toothbrushing and take a one or two minute less uh shower you know because that's what the other thing the, sh the movie the, you know cow Spearcy, the film tried to project is that you know that's that's good to do that but it's a couple gallons a day versus over a thousand gallons a day that you'd say by not eating uh dairy or, or any animal products Another question was about the topsoil. So in the address that you did to the parliament, you had said that topsoil will be lost in 60 years. So can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a great topic, and uh, it's a great question. And the, most, the easiest way I can say this, and actually this, this, can, uh, this can be an extension of what I was just asked about the degradation in some of these countries by uh, animal agriculture and livestock. So what happens is this. Uh, over two-thirds of our topsoil uh, has been lost in most areas of, of the world. It's a little over half as an average, close to two-thirds in many areas. So, so picture, picture us losing two-thirds, 60 to 70 percent, of all the mechanism, the, the substance that will help grow uh, our, our, you know, plants for us to eat. Okay, in some areas of the world, it's, it's been completely gone. Uh, it's, it's completely gone into uh, a situation called uh, desertification because that's essentially what it's doing. It's turning into sand and becoming uh, desertified. Okay. And this is a very large topic today because most scientists and most organizations that are funding recovery uh, projects are, are viewing this in, in the sense that, okay, desertification is a problem, and so therefore we have to find some way to, to um, bring the topsoil back. But the issue is really this. You have to look at the first part of the equation. Most desertification, if not all desertification, is, is a byproduct of erosion, soil erosion. And before soil really becomes eroded, you deforest it. So you take, you take lands and you, you cut down trees. And, and, and so that's really the beginning of this equation is deforestation. And so the number one culprit of deforestation in the world is not... It, we, a good deal of it is from just human growth, you know, and, you know, we, we grew in, in terms of population growth. But most of it, the vast majority of it is due to livestock because it's land intensive. So that's why the rainforests are being uh, toppled. And that's why temperate, and moderate, or temperate rainforests are being uh, destroyed. It's because, it's because we need to create land uh, to, to produce crops and livestock to graze on. So, if, so the point is, is if we just stop deforesting uh, land, we would then halt the erosion issue, which would then halt the desertification issue. And that's where our topsoil is being lost. So if, if that, that's how topsoil has been lost, and that's also how we can prevent it from further loss by replanting, you know, creating more agroforestry, create, creating more plants, and then stop the grazing, 
the overgrazing and the uh, trampling of, of plants. So that's how we're in a topsoil uh, predicament right now, and that's how we can also solve it. Okay, I have another question from a student um, about combating the money issue. So how could we effectively combat the meat and dairy industry in terms of money availability and stigma? I am sure the meat and dairy industry would not take lightly to a movement against their products that could potentially affect their income. There also already exists a stigma that some vegans are annoying due to how vehemently they protest against the meat industry. And I'm quoting well, from my student. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's separate. I, I think sometimes we need to separate questions out. So let's separate that out a little bit. You know, um, first of all, a very quick comment about the, the last, the last uh, part of that, which is yeah, it, it depends how you view uh, annoying, isn't it? Like, you know, most vegans are trying to save lives, to save the planet. Mm -hmm. So I guess if, you know, I guess you could say that's annoying. I know exactly what that person is talking about because um, it's not just annoying, but some, some purely plant-based advocates become aggressive, okay? Mm -hmm. But they're only aggressive because they're trying to save, they're trying to save things. And so mm -hmm. that has to be taken with a grain of salt. Now, back to the rest of the question is that, Let's, let's answer that by saying, you know, uh, that every five years, every five years, the U.S. dietary guidelines come out. I know you know quite a bit about this, okay? But from an environmental standpoint, it was the first time in the history of our, of our country and of the U.S. dietary guidelines that their advisory, their prestigious advisory committee um, is strongly, strongly recommended that the environment take into consideration uh, be taken into consideration with our, our final dietary guidelines. Well, the meat and dairy industries, similar to what this person is asking, uh, lobbied heavily, and so it was never it was never it was never mentioned in dietary guidelines. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to do two things as a general as a member of the general public. We have to uh, promote uh, reducing our footprint as quickly as possible and as large as possible to our policymakers and to, uh, and to everybody around us, our sphere of individual, sphere, sphere of friends, family, uh, uh, and uh, social media, and, and get, on, get, on the, get on the track where we can create change uh, on our own and stop, and we can, we can vote with our dollar. And if everybody got together on this, and uh, you know, it's a demand issue, that's what it is. So, you better believe that the meat and dairy industries don't want you to do this. But yet, if we did this and, and supported all plant-based products, we, we would put them out of business or, or they would have to transition. You know, McDonald's could be one of the world's greatest plant-based uh, uh, chain of restaurants, you know, uh, if we really demand it. It's, it's, about, it's about consumer demand. And I often said that, to summarize, I often said I don't even know what state the Twinkie is in right now, and I don't even know if your students know what Twinkies are, but I used to say for the last 40 years, you, know, you better believe if we stopped eating Twinkies that they wouldn't be made. You know? mm -hmm. so, so the same thing applies to the and dairy industries. And so I think that that's what needs to be done. And we also need to uh, help our policymakers get behind this because there'll be a point in time where uh, legislation will have to take place, especially as we start running out of water uh, more and more. Uh, that This will have to take place. There were several questions about um, people were concerned about the activists that were killed in Brazil and how one of the questions from a student said, how did we know that it was a hired gun that killed the nun in Brazil? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that you can answer that question, but yeah. it was brought up. Well, I can answer it as a, as a, as a broad uh, summary of, of in that area. I can't answer it everywhere else in the world. But in Brasilia, in the Amazon area of Brazil, and in their other six or seven countries that, that the Amazon is part of or uh, extends into, the vast majority of, of uh, advocates that were murdered, uh, the, 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 the meat industry, the beef industry, uh, took responsibility for it. I mean, it was found out that, they, that they, these were advocates that... Uh, that had sort of a target on them. 
I don't know about the nun herself, uh, but I'm sure that that was one part of the film that I didn't personally do the research on. I mean, that was one of the rare things that I didn't, I didn't go back and look that up, but I, I, I know it had to be done. Uh, I know that the research is pretty accurate, um, especially after uh, uh, Mr. DiCaprio got a, got a hold of the film for Netflix. You know, had to make sure that everything was real tight, which I had already, all the environmental issues I had very tight. Something like that, you know, they went back over. And, uh, so, uh, and, and I'm glad that there are a lot of questions about that because it really strikes a chord, doesn't it, with anybody who advocates anything. Uh, you know, it's really sad that you can't, speak your mind and, and try to make a change in the world without, um, you know, your life possibly being at stake. And kind of to follow up on that, there's a couple of those related questions, but one is about the Patriot Act because of what Howard Lyman had shared during the film. So the question was, is it possible to change the Patriot Act in order for people to not get sued for speaking the truth about yeah. products like beef, et cetera? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, Howard, uh, what he said in the movie was was fairly fairly accurate, and it, but not in terms of um, in terms of dynamics, uh, because it can change. And I think that you're seeing uh, on the periphery on the on the periphery of that you're seeing some of the ad gag laws and what's occurring with those. You know, initially it was uh, very strict. You know, there was, there was uh, a few laws that were passed. Uh, very specific for for, for uh, quieting anybody who uh, would uh, uh, put into the public eye uh, something that would be, be deemed as detrimental to the meat dairy industry, such as filming in slaughterhouses and things like that. Well, now uh, courts are starting to see that um, that they that that's not going to be up, upheld. I mean, they're they're looking at um, there have been a number of these ag laws that have been reversed or modified. And so I think the same thing's going to happen with the Patriot Act. And again, it's the same thing. It's a matter of how many people get behind it. Uh, I don't think that, I don't think the, the youth today, you know, meaning anybody under my age probably, <laughs> I, don't think that, I don't think that anybody really wants to put up with uh, a, 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 a skewed view of reality. You know, I think that everybody really, I think all of your students could probably agree with me saying that they don't want to live their lives in, you know, obscured reality because of a, uh, in industry, in any industry, but especially with uh, the meat and dairy industries that are doing so much damage to our environment that, that they don't own, you know, and it's uh, none of us own it. Um, and we certainly shouldn't be doing irreversible damage to it in our lifetime. So I think everybody's going to have to get together on this, you know, and keep moving it forward to change the page back. That same student had asked a question, have you received any threats or been warned by anyone since the release of the documentary? because she was unnerved by the whole situation with Kip losing funding and then that piece of that movie that felt heavy. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, uh, I applaud her for, I mean, bless her heart, you know, for thinking through that because, again, you know, we're just trying to find the truth in things and then convey the truth. So, you know, it's really sad, isn't it, that, you know, you have those type of hurdles in front of you. So, so first of all, you know, thank, thank her for that, for thinking it through, being so thoughtful with it. Um, I haven't had, I haven't had anything that I would say that I would worry about. Um, I've had a number of things um, come my way that I know that uh, certain industries are watching me. And I know that, uh, I mean, I, I, you can see it very easily because you can see, you know, I can, you can find out, you do the research and see who's on your, on your website and you know what's going on. But I've never received a threat you know, or, or a voodoo doll in the mail, you know, that looks like me with a couple needles in it. I haven't seen anything that stark yet, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried. I mean, my family's pretty worried uh, about it because they've seen some, some, some of the industries that, that are watching what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm not too worried right now. No, I'm going to keep moving forward. And I, and I applaud her for thinking of that. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to ask your question? You can ask your question. Okay, we're trying to get up some <laughs> confidence here. <One> second. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering if um, any environmental groups have changed and started to recognize um, animal agriculture since the movie came out. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. So thanks for coming forward with that. Because isn't that 
isn't that really what we're trying to do? We're trying to create change. So you'd like to have a metric, wouldn't you? Uh, just what you said, like, okay, great. The movie's good. It puts, sets forth some truth. What results do you have, right, um, for all that effort? So the short answer is yes, we've seen some results. Um, Sierra Club was pretty embarrassed about, about you know, their representation of, of their knowledge at that point in time. And they're starting to make some uh, more profound statements about the effects of animal agriculture, specifically our environment. Whereas at the time that it was made, there was nothing. So there are a few environmental groups that are doing that. Greenpeace has been discussing with me a number of things. Uh, I, met, I met with leaders of, of international leaders of most of these groups in UK and London uh, about a year ago. And I spoke there. I was one of the three speakers. And uh, it was great to see everybody there. And they're making some changes. So that's, that's in one direction. <laughs> it was great to see that. You know, it was great to see that uh, meeting and that conference. It was great that they allowed me to speak on behalf of, of uh, eliminating meat and dairy rather than just eating less of it. Um, but the fact is, in the other direction, to summarize the other direction of the, the answer to your question, is I haven't seen enough change by enough of them quick enough. Mm. And, and that's the one thing that this movie, this film, didn't portray enough of. Uh, and it's not anything negative about the film, it's just they only had so much time. But, but the thing that we all need to remember is that we're on timelines. Uh, the film was just a set forth foundation that we have a serious problem here. But we really all need to also take it one step further and realize that all the problems that you saw depicted in the movie, they all have timelines attached to them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're running out of fresh water at a certain time. We're running out of land at a certain time. It's not that we can get in. That's, that's a important thing to remember because, and that's why we need to get these uh, these conservation groups in line because we can't make changes just when we get around to it. You know, that's the whole point because of these tipping points. So the final, you know, the final thing I can say about your question is uh, I'd like to see all of these groups apply those timelines and say, we understand, we understand that we're in a dire predicament here. We're in overshoot mode and most of it's due to animal agriculture and it's something we can change today. So if they all advocate eat less meat, that's fine. But I'd like them to have a qualification statement by saying, let's eat less meat. But understand, that's not, that's not, not, not what's going to be in our best interest of our planet. So we, we are just doing that because we don't have enough faith in, you know, this is what they should say, a qualification statement. We just, we're, we're advocating less meat because we don't, we don't lose our audience. <laughs> and we don't have enough faith in the human species that they can all change in the next week. That's essentially what, you know, they need to say. And that's where I'm pushing next year, you know, to get these organizations on board. And so have, I hope that helped. Have any of them actually said we should start eating less meat? No. All, yes. Okay. So at this meeting, uh, it was about a year ago, they all agreed. Uh, that was the positive take that I got. I get positives out of everything now. You know, I try to take a positive, uh, a positive look on anything. So I walked away from that, from the UK, from that London meeting, and said to myself, you know what? Right, just, just, what you, just what you asked. All of the worldwide, all of them that were there, World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, uh, you know, all the big hitters were there, basically. They all agreed we should be eating less meat. So the problem is, <laughs> that's not going to get us where we need to be. Because eating less meat, again, just like I kind of sadly quipped in the, in the film, you know, just because you're eating less meat, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't get us to the point where we need to be because... Um, it's subjective, and it's not in line with where our planet, what our planet needs. So, um, so the takeaway is, is that we have a lot of work to do. So none of them are, none of them are moving in the direction that we need to be. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, I to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, one of the people in the audience is too shy to ask a question. But oh. I know I'm Good trying to get her up here. But she was wondering about how um, how do we approach the meat industry itself? And I know you've alluded to the supply and demand, but to more accurately or more directly approach the meat industry or um, the 
large farmers because it is hotly uh, contested by them. It is. But look, let's look at it this way. Um, let's try to quickly summarize an answer because because that really we could talk for a few hours about that. That's really about how to change, how to create change. Okay. So first of all, there isn't anything greater. There really isn't anything greater than uh, demand. There isn't. I mean, it's a Twinkie theory. Um, mm -hmm. the, so the problem is more how can we all get other people to change mm -hmm. to create the demand? That's the biggest issue. Okay. The second issue is, is that, you know, there, despite what the meat and dairy industries are doing on their own, a number of people, a number of organizations, and a number of policymakers are starting to understand and get this connection. It's not such a big disconnect anymore. They're starting to get the connection between animal agriculture and a lot of our sustainability woes. Okay? So now how can we get them to enact policies? So we can get behind, we can get behind and suggest Go meet with your policymakers. You know they 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 rely on you to vote for them. They're not in office without you voting for them. So <clears throat> get behind them and say, "We know that animal agriculture is creating a lot of problems." And don't shake your head at me, Mr. Senator or Mrs. Sen Ms. Senator or whatever. You know we know this. Okay. So how do we enact policies <clears throat> to transition them? Which there have been a number of of of, of uh, farms that I've interviewed myself. We've done a number of studies on them that have transitioned quite nicely. But there has to be a, a shift in subsidies. Those same policies that have held up uh, animal agriculture and livestock operations for all these years, since the 1930s, 1940s, those same policies, they just need to be changed, tweaked a little bit, so that they're now uh, providing money to support transitioning farms from livestock operations to uh, plant-based systems. So I really think that that's, that's the key. Create the demand. Help your policymakers to create transitional policies, uh, and then work on educating. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll give you one quick example. I was interviewed for a, a film on water. It's going to be a main, mainstream film, and it was it was uh, it, it's being produced obviously in California because that's where you guys were having you know the one of the more serious water issue. Okay, well, most of the people that they're interviewing and uh, are complaining that there's just a drought and there's less water and they're turning towards desalination plants in San Diego and uh, you know uh, <clears throat> charging more for water and things like that they're missing the whole point the whole point is you have to they have to reduce their their uh, their water footprint and they don't know most people in California don't know that what they're carrying in terms of their virtual water footprint now, I don't believe that just providing them with information is the, you know, going to solve everything. I have a neighbor that is, is a, a profound you know, deer hunter. And you know, I can tell him all I want to, that deer hurt, and you know, he shouldn't be shooting deer. And, but it's not going to change. So sooner or later, there's going to have to be policymakers. So what I'm saying is, is that this film that, we were, that they were producing, you know, my goal in the film was to make sure that uh, the film producers, the directors, and the audience uh, will understand this, the role of animal agriculture in their water footprint, which will then solve the problems that you're having in California. You know, I mean, one statistic that, that everybody should know is that while you're running out of water in California, okay, uh, you also have 900,000 acres that are being used for alfalfa. So with quick calculations, anyone can see that, you know, you can save a few gallons of water a day by those things we just talked about, but if California just stopped growing alfalfa for livestock for one year, just for one year, it would be enough fresh water to, to provide drinking water for the entire human population of San Francisco. All, all the humans in San Francisco could drink water for 66 years just by, just by, not, just by saving the water from livestock you know, for one year, and that's just from alfalfa. So, I mean, those are some of the statistics that people need to know, and then spread the word, mm -hmm. and that's just about water, and then start creating policy change. And then I think that then we can get on track to where we need to be. Excellent. Do you have one? We have one more question from the audience. Sure, great. Hi, Dr. Oprah Lander. I had a question. Hello. Um, so, 
What advice do you have for students who would like to create a positive change towards a sustainable found system? Well, you're talking about students on their own? I mean, as students? Okay. And are you talking about sustainability programs within your matrix of your campus or within your life sphere or community or everything? It could be for everything, but yeah, oh, I guess overall. Okay. So, so what you could do as a student to create a more sustainable world through your actions. Is that, is that, is that the essence of the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Okay. 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 Because because actually that is that is the most important question any student could ask, <laughs> and so but it's a but it's a very large, it it deserves a lot of a lot of different types of answers. So the best way I can say this is, number one, lead by example. Okay, you can you you you, you can empower so many different people on your own by just leading by example, and that doesn't mean what. What Tim Marie said earlier about somebody being annoying, you know, but you know, find a fine line of how to empower somebody else by educating them in a kind way. I wouldn't even call it education; just enlighten them in in a tactful way, and then set an example by what you're doing. Now, so that would include social media, include all your friends, family, relatives, all your student peer groups. Okay. Secondly, is enlighten your your faculty members. Go meet with your dining services people, go meet with your community leaders, go meet with policymakers. They need to hear from you. You're, you're the voice that's going to put them in office or you're the one that's going to keep the person on staff on staff. Okay. And, and next is also create powerful peer groups, um, student groups. I mean, create groups that where you can make, you can, you can uh, create petitions and you can you can go in and speak with sustainability leaders or people who should be leading your sustainability efforts on campus. You know, let me, let, me, let me summarize by saying there's no campus anywhere in the United States today and really no business, no community that does not have a sustainability policy. Really, they, they don't. I don't think they could stay in position where they are if they don't have a sustainability policy. So that means the door is open for you, doesn't it? I mean, if they have a policy, for sustainability. The problem is food food choice is not properly positioned, right? That that's the problem. But at least the door's been opened by them, you know, saying we have a sustainability policy, right? So do what you can to um, enlighten those people, either by uh, petitions or just you talking to them or gathering groups and talking to them. Um, but but encourage them to properly position food choice in any sustainability effort. Okay. And that would get the most change. That would create the most change, the most dynamic change that I think could happen. Also, funding. Anytime you come across any money that's being spent for anything, if you see where food choice could be positioned into those funds, whether it's philanthropy or funds that um, you're spending or the funds that your, your family's spending or your peers are spending or groups are spending, uh, whatever it is, encourage them to spend their funds wisely for the most sustainable food choices possible, which can only be plant-based. And I think that would that would serve as the nucleus for how you how you carry about yourself, you know, your life, without being annoying. <laughs> right? Yeah. Does that help at all? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Oh no, thank you. <laughs> so Dr. Openlander, I want to finish, but I want to let you know that our Thrive on Plants Club that we started, this charter club last year. We're yes. doing um, this top on the quad, which is going to be tomorrow, and we'll have more than 10. I think we'll have probably 12 tables, and they're all nice. going to be student-run, and they're nice. all showing students how to be more self-sustainable. So everything from how to use your rice cooker to make more than rice, how to use a crock pot, and it's all plant-based, whole food recipes, all oh, those choices. Fantastic. And that's and tomorrow? That's tomorrow, and we're doing – um, so – Timmy, the woman who just asked a question, she is doing a table on how to save water with your fork. So we did that presentation last Earth Day or Earth Week on campus. So we'll bring that back this, this Earth Week as well. But we're going to table that tomorrow. And Wonderful. from every angle, from saving money at the um, grocery store to how to actually use your blender to make you know, plant-based sauces and dressings and all those types nice. of things. 
So we're using um, that platform, and the right. default is it's all plan based. It's right. a, so that's just the norm, right. and that's what we're that setting is the norm. Up. That's that's exactly right, and that's a that's a beautiful way to present or to enlighten or to present alternatives and options, and also present avenues for people. As you know, uh, you you have to create these pathways for them to get to where they really want to go. I mean, no one really wants to ruin the planet. I don't think. Um, Maybe my neighbor does. You know, I just talked about, but you know, but nobody really, you know, really would want to ruin the planet. And you, so you have to find ways to do that. And you're right. So the default is, oh, by the way, you know, if they really ask about it, oh, by the way, yeah, sure, it's plant based. You know, it's over here in the corner. But, but um, yeah, that's they're, great. They're more concerned about easy, quick, and tasty. And so if we can deliver right. that, um, then and like I said, that's the new normal. Then that's our plan is to be very much on the positive aspect of it and the show right. the how to. So thank it's you so much. Thing. Well, you know, I know where you could get a really beautifully put together uh, cookbook too <laughs> for that. Yes, <laughs> that, that we need to spread more of those too. Yes, we uh, do. I do. I, I do want to say that um, unless you have some more questions, I do want to say this right now. Even if you had more questions, I want to say that I, I greatly appreciate uh, your students. I greatly appreciate the questions. Um, I greatly appreciate you for putting this together. Um, and it's not just me. I'm saying I, on behalf of our planet, and and all those that we inhabit it with, and all the future generations. It's really uh, a great thing for me to see this. So um, thank you so very much for all your efforts. Everybody there needs to applaud themselves, you know, for what they're doing. Thank you so much.